It's been a while since I've done a bus for myself. The last one was, yeah, seven years ago. And uh, boy, I've learned a lot since then. So I'm very excited to put my new knowledge to work and have a shop to work in while we still have it and, uh, and see what I can build for myself. Um, it's gonna be really cool. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy uh, following along as I share with you all of my tips and tricks for building the ultimate school bus conversion. Let's go get that bus. All right, let's get that bus. So we were down at, last night I think we got down to about five degrees is what I saw. So, you know, the odds of this starting are slim to none, but uh, we're gonna give it a shot and I don't have any starting fluid or ether. Uh, try not to use that stuff. So we'll see how good we do. Let's just see what we got. Uh, batteries I'm sure will die and we'll probably have to get a charger out here and try this again in a couple hours. But for now, let's just see what we do. The batteries are weak too, so. All right, here we go. Oh, oh here we go, here we go. I'm saying it's probably not gonna start, huh? Well, that was expected, so I can't really say I'm disappointed. Throw a battery charger on there and uh, see if we got any. Yeah, I don't have any ether. Mm, I can smell the unburned diesel though. So everything's working as it should. It's a little bit later in the day now. Um, batteries have been charging for a minute. Uh, I noticed this bus doesn't have a block heater, which is really interesting and kind of a bummer. Otherwise, I would have loved to just plug that in. Um, these batteries are totally just on their last legs and um, it doesn't seem like they're going to hold enough charge for me to be able to crank this enough to start it without ether and starting fluid. So we're going to go ahead and pop the hood and give it a little of the uh, fire juice and go in and crank it and I'm sure it'll fire off. Um, definitely needs three new batteries. It's only got two batteries. I think the school district took one out before they auctioned it, which is not at all uncommon. So I'm going to pop the hood on this guy and uh, squirt some juice and should get a, should just fire right off, hopefully. Like I said, I don't really love using this stuff, but um, we'll use it sparingly. If you notice, so that motor is not your typical International Harvester Blue, um, which is what you would see there. Uh, that's because this is a Reviva remanufactured motor, which uh, is pretty sweet. So we'll give it a little shoo doo doo doo, -doo. That should be plenty. And uh, come in here, get you set up so you have a good view of the action or lack thereof maybe. <laughs> And see what we get. To be expected. Now what I like to do is uh, go ahead and I'm going to set the throttle lock to uh, oh, about 1100 RPMs. And we'll just let this kind of wake up. It hasn't been run in months. We'll let this just kind of wake up and uh, get a little warmed up before we pull it into the shop. All right. So I've let it idle, well, high idle, for a couple minutes. It's got air pressure and I think most of the cobwebs are out. So I'm gonna get this old girl into the shop and uh, when it leaves, it's gonna be 12 inches taller.
these uh, mid-size, full-size chassis buses that are mid-length like this, because the steering wheel turns very sharp, and because they're not the full length, they just, they freaking turn. They're maneuverable. Ty has got my door, and we're gonna tuck this girl right in here. Woo! <laughs> Let's get to work. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the shop. It's a beautiful day, made even more beautifuler by the fact that this old girl is indoors. I'm gonna be getting started on the demolition today in preparation for the roof raise that I'll be doing on it next week. Um, before I get started on that though, I thought it would be a great time to go ahead and make a video, tell you about this bus, why I bought this bus, and what makes it special. And maybe give you a little insight into things I look for when I'm purchasing a bus. Give you some information that I think you'll find useful if this is something you're considering doing for yourself. There are a lot of different styles of school buses out there, so what led me to this one? Well, the first thing is it's a conventional bus, also called like a dog nose bus or a, I think even a type C bus. Um, I like these buses because this hood opens up and allows easy access to the engine. Um, if you're gonna be doing any of their pairs, especially if you're doing it yourself, it's wonderful to be able to just hop in, stand on top of the engine and do what needs to be done. I really appreciate that. I also like the driving position. Um, in a transit style bus or a flat front bus, you're actually sitting way off to the driver's side, like right up against that wall. And so lane position feels a little less intuitive to me or somebody who's more used to driving a passenger vehicle. And the tendency then is to position your body too far to the right in the lane and then you get a little bit close to the shoulder. I don't really like that feel. This puts you a lot closer to the middle and I like that. I like that visibility and that feel more. I also really like the idea that if I'm ever in an accident, I've got this whole zone in front of me that's gonna go long before anything up front ever gets to me. Now, hopefully that's never gonna happen, but that's the reason why I went with the conventional style. The other thing I love about this particular bus in particular is that it's only 27 and a half feet long. Um, that means, you know, being under 30 feet means you're really not gonna be subject to almost any length restrictions, which is wonderful. Um, the other cool thing is these buses all have the same front end. So the, the wheels can turn super sharp, which is something you need in like a 40 foot bus. But because this bus is way less than 40 feet, those wheels turning really sharp means that this bus turns very sharp. I can do U-turns on you know like two and a half lane wide roads which is something that you're not going to be able to do in like a 40 foot bus or even a 35 foot bus um, this thing's a blast to drive it's super easy to drive um, and i think it's a lot more approachable to drive this kind of a bus if you're someone who's got anxiety about operating a big vehicle than say a 40 foot long flat front bluebird which isn't to say that those aren't good buses but um you know, if, if you're out there bus shopping, rear engine buses are awesome because the engine's behind you. They ride really smooth usually. Um, and those are actually quite easy to work on too. Not, not as easy as this, but it's close. Um, the trade-off is that those almost never come in a length less than 30 feet. I mean, I've only seen one ever that was 30 feet long and I've never seen any shorter than that. Um, the other type of bus, you know, which is gonna be your flat front, front engine bus, um, it puts the engine right next to you, the driver, and I'm not a fan of that because it's really loud and it can get hot. And then when you go to work on it, you've gotta be 
like you're basically laying down <laughs> on your hands and knees getting into it from the top and you have almost no access from the front. So changing belts, doing any kind of work on the front of the engine is a huge hassle. And it's definitely the hardest type of bus to work on. Um, and probably my least favorite in terms of the mechanical layout. The upside there uh, is that those always have the shortest wheelbase consistently. So if you're looking for a full size bus that is in the 25 foot range up to 30 feet, somewhere in there, um, you're going to be looking at a flat front front engine bus. And they usually have awesome turning abilities, which is really cool. They're super maneuverable um, and they are going to be short but they're harder to work on, they're noisier, and you know they put you right next to the engine. Not my favorite. I guess the upside is if you're doing engine work, it's right in your living room. <laughs> so if it's raining outside or whatever, that's not gonna stop you, um, you know, from checking your fluids, but not my personal favorite, but to each their own. But that's why I landed on this um, international Thomas bus, 27 and a half feet long uh, conventional bus. Let's talk about mileage. This is one of my favorite hot takes I can give you. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it in the forums, on the internet, where people say, oh, that's a million mile engine, or that, ba that baby's barely broken in. She's good for a million miles. You know, oh, it's a million mile motor. Million mile. Yeah, a million mile motor. You know? How many times have you heard that? Probably a lot, especially if you've been shopping for buses. The truth is, you're not going to get to a million miles. You're not going to even get to 500,000 miles. Probably not 400,000, and I'd be surprised if you actually make it to 300,000. And that's because these engines in a bus, in service, are under extreme duty. It's severe service, and they're pretty much always going to be ready to give up the ghost at any moment after about 200 or 250,000 miles. You got to be ready for a catastrophic failure at any time once you get to that mileage. And that's my opinion is somebody who is owned and operated literally over a hundred buses and they've all been old used school buses. Does that mean that you're doomed if you buy a school bus to have to rebuild or replace the engine? Absolutely not. The truth is most of us aren't going to put a whole lot of miles on these vehicles and if they're highway miles and we take care of the service and make sure that they get all the preventative maintenance that they need it's reasonable to expect that you should be able to get all of the service that you want out of it without a rebuild, as long as you're smart when you're making the initial engine purchase. This bus here has 162,000 miles, I believe, which is outstanding because we're well below that 250,000 mile scary zone and because it's already got a new engine in it. I don't know how many miles are on this engine, but because it was put in five years ago, in the last two years it hasn't been in service, I feel really good that that motor's got a lot of life left in it. Um, if I were out there buying a bus that didn't have a new motor with low miles, the things I'd be looking for when I'm out there bus shopping are blow-by, and that is essentially com combustion gases getting by the piston rings because the piston rings are worn out and the only way to replace that is or to fix that is to replace the piston rings which means rebuilding the engine and the way you test for that is with the engine running you take off the oil cap and you look for smoke coming out of it not just like a little waft because that's normal it's puffing smoke and you want to put your hand on it if you feel like a of uh, pressure that's a sign that your engine has blow by and it's probably going to need a rebuild soon so Next time you're out there, you're bus shopping, if the person selling you the bus says, that's a million mile motor, you should just write off any opinion that they have from there forward because they're clearly blowing smoke up your butt just trying to sell you a bus. Um, this bus isn't gonna get a million miles on it. It's not gonna get 500,000, you know? If it makes it to 300, I'd be tickled. So, no such thing as a million mile motor, in my opinion. Let's be honest, if it weren't for this thing, you're not going anywhere. So I want to start by talking about the engine. This bus has an international DT 466 NGD. That stands for next generation diesel. And it was the last model that they made of the DT 466 before they fitted computer controlled injection system to it. This bus uses an all mechanical Bosch P pump, which you'll also find on a Cummins uh, 12 valve. And I believe it's also on um, 
the 5.9 and I think the 8.3. And uh, I think I've also seen it on a couple of old Ford engines as well. Anyways, it's a very reliable motor and there's no computers on it. And we've had computer controlled engines for a long time and we've really got it down. But there's a few things that I prefer about an all mechanical engine that led me to picking up this one. The first thing is if something's going wrong, you don't need any special tools or diagnostics to figure it out. You can just take a whiff, take a seat, you know, check, see how it feels. And right away, you can usually kind of get a feel for what the hell's going on. It's a lot different when you have a blinky light pop up or some weird intermittent problem. And I've definitely spent days and weeks chasing gremlins and wire harnesses to try to rectify those problems only to find out that I have to take it to a dealer and have them hook their magic bloop, bloop, up to it and figure out what's going on. The cool thing about this engine is all you got to do to get it running is start it spinning. As soon as you start spinning this engine, the compression in the cylinders and the fuel from the injection pump, take it from there and you're off and running. It's really cool. It's also something where you have to be a little more cognizant of what's going on as you're driving because it won't shut itself down if say it loses oil pressure or it starts to overheat. It's just gonna beep at you and you're really depending on that beep <laughs> to let you know when things are going wrong. So you definitely gotta be in the habit of checking your gauges. I like that this engine is an inline six. Um, in my opinion, inline engines are just always a superior style of engine to a V8 or a V configuration engine. Uh, the reason for that is there's less things to go wrong. It's inherently smoother and well, those are the reasons actually. <laughs> um, when you have a V shaped engine, you have two cylinder heads, one on each side, which means you have two head gaskets and two cylinder heads. So there's twice as many things to fail in that regard. Also, a straight six engine is unique in that it is perfectly balanced. So the firing order syncs up with the rotational mass of the engine to create an engine that's always inherently smooth. And that's not going to be true on all V engines. It's not even true on an inline four cylinder. You have to have some, time, some type of harmonic balancer to uh, counteract the explosions happening in the pistons and keep things balanced. The last thing that I really like about an inline six is that it has seven main bearings. The main bearing is what holds the crankshaft in place. And as you can imagine, the crankshaft has a lot of forces acting on it. So a uh, straight six has a bearing on each end and between every cylinder. Um, that makes for an engine that's going to be super, super robust. And if you look at some of the greatest engines made in terms of reliability, they're almost always going to be a straight six. And that's because you just can't beat them. And there's a reason why, you know, all the big rigs out there now are sporting the straight sixes. So I know a lot of people love the V8s. They love the international V8s. And um, I got to be honest, I'm just not a fan. And if it's got a computer, I dislike it even more. So when I was shopping, I wanted this bus. And what's special is that it's a big engine in a small bus. And that's a great combination if you ask me. And what's also great about this engine is it's 7.6 liters of displacement, but this unit only makes about 200 horsepower. So when you have a big engine with low power output, that's a recipe for longevity. So if you think about those old, you know, Mercedes diesel engines that just run for, for what seems like forever. And I've had the privilege of working on and, and owning one of those, um, you know, those engines weigh not a ton, but hundreds of pounds, but they don't make, I think over 150 horsepower. So when you've got a big cast iron block putting out low power, you're going to get a lot of life out of it, which is what I'm hoping for, for this. And what really sweetened the deal for me when I was looking for a bus is that this motor is actually only five years old. There's a tag on it. It is a remanufactured motor from Reviva and uh, it was put in in 2017, which, uh, well, that really sweetened the pot for me. So a little hot take on motors. I'm partial to internationals. Um, Cummins makes a great motor. The Mercedes uh, motors are also really great. Don't be afraid of the Mercedes brand. Um, all diesels are expensive and in my experience, those have proved to be very reliable even though they do have a computer on there. Um, Caterpillar, you know, they make a good motor. Not really my cup of tea, but um, 
some people out there swear by them. I think the most important thing is that you get a motor that's the style of motor that you want, a straight six or V8 or whatever, and has the features that you want and the power output that you want and go from there. Um, I would much rather have a big motor in a little bus than a little motor in a big bus um, for reasons that should be pretty obvious. So there it is, the beating heart of this bus and honestly, really the reason why I bought it. I'll just call out a few things since we're here. Sorry about the shop noise, but this is that injection pump I was talking about. It's a Bosch P pump. And down here, we've got the air compressor. And if you'll notice, I mean, everything on this bus is just super clean because this engine is only a few years old, which is just amazing. I'm tickled. Coming off the back of that, we've actually got the um, power steering hose uh, <clears throat> and pump. And one cool thing about this NGD um, DT-466 that other earlier models don't have is um, all of these accessories are actually driven by gears in this timing case here, which is cool. So there's no belts running those that can break. There is still a belt, but it's a serpentine belt and it's super easy to change because it's got a belt tensioner. And I mean, you can just go on there and I could have that belt off in, I mean, a minute. <laughs> um, so if you look on the top here, I'll see if I can, see if I can show you. Let's see, if you look right there, date re remanufactured 9-8-2017, pretty awesome. So that's great, and top down, you can't do this or get this view <laughs> on a rear engine bus like my business partner Ben's. Um, I love these dog nose buses, they look, they look right to me and I don't know if they get any easier to work on. There's that serpentine belt I was talking about and a uh, new alternator, isn't that nice? So really something special, this engine here. Moving on from the engine, the next most important part about the bus's drivetrain is obviously the transmission. Um, if I'm being honest, it's my least favorite part about this particular bus, but it's not something I'm too worried about. Um, and that's because this bus has an Allison AT545. Um, it has a reputation for not being super reliable and liking to overheat. And that's really deserved only in the bigger buses that it's found in. This bus being 27 and a half feet long and not weighing a whole lot, it's not something I'm super worried about. And I'm gonna be adding an aftermarket transmission cooler to help mitigate that problem. But it's something to pay attention to when you're out there shopping for a bus um, the transmission is going to make a big, big mark in terms of how the vehicle performs and handles. So pretty much every bus is going to have an Allison transmission. That's a given. Um, it's the model of Allison that you need to worry about. So the AT545 is a four speed transmission. It's all mechanical, just like the rest of the bus. There's no computer. It doesn't have overdrive, which means that in fourth gear, it's a one to one ratio. Overdrive would be like a one to a 0.85 ratio, which means that, you know, just like in a manual transmission, when you put it in fifth gear, the RPMs drop and it's really nice for highway cruising. It drops the engine RPM, it's gonna improve fuel economy and the engine's probably gonna last a little longer. Um, the next transmission up is gonna be an Allison MT643 or 647 or the 600 series. Um, that's a heavier duty transmission and what it has over this model that I like, which if this one ever goes out, I'll definitely be swapping in in a 600 series, is the torque converter, which is kind of like the clutch. The torque converter on that series transmission locks up, which means the input and output, which spin at different speeds in this model, in that model, they lock up, which means you're not losing any efficiency. There's no slippage, and that's really nice. Um, it keeps the transmission temperatures down, and when you're going down the highway, you're gonna get a little more fuel economy, and it might even bump your top speed up a couple miles an hour. But really what I'm in it for is the locking torque converter. In addition, it's just a heavier duty transmission. It's one that you would find um, stock on bigger buses and uh, you know, like garbage trucks and things like that. So you know it's gonna take a little more abuse before it gives up the ghost. Um, moving out of that, there is the Allison uh, HT700 series, but that's something that you're only gonna find on coach buses. It's a super heavy duty transmission. And um, 
I don't think I've seen those on any school buses except for Crown school buses and Gillig school buses. So moving up, you get into the computer controlled Allisons. Um, there's the 1000 series, the 2000 series, and then the, the 3000 series. And all of those are computer controlled, um, which has its pros and cons. Um, but they all feature locking torque converters, which is really cool, and they all have overdrive. Um, in some cases, they even have a double overdrive. The Allison um, MD3066 is actually a six-speed transmission, which means you get gears one through four. Four is still a one-to-one -one ratio. Then you have five as an overdrive. I think it's 0.85, and then six, which is I think 0.66 to one. So that means you know if you're cruising down the highway. Um, sure, it could add to your top speed, which is nice, but the real advantage is that it's going to drop your engine RPMs way down. Um, and that means your fuel economy, again, is going to go up, engine noise is going to go down, and you should see more longevity out of that engine because it's not turning as fast. Um, it's not as clear cut to me uh, as with computer controlled engines, um, you know, if computer controlled transmissions. Um, you know, the performance gains you get from them are pretty nice. So in my opinion, it, it may be worth, you know, biting the bullet. And if you can find a mechanical engine with a computer controlled transmission, um, there was a brief period of time when they existed and that was a real sweet spot. But, um, you know, the ability to have a double overdrive is really nice, especially if you're going to be doing highway cruising, which I think most of us are. This bus right now, the top speed is about 68 miles an hour, um, but the engine's just screaming. So I will be considering uh, putting in a different set of gears in the rear differential, and that's gonna give me better cruising RPMs and a higher cruising speed at the expense of a little bit worse acceleration. But I'm not trying to win races, I'm trying to keep my engine around as long as I can and get good fuel economy on the highway. So. I think that's about all you need to know about transmissions. If I miss something, let me know. It's where the rubber meets the road, so we gotta talk about tires. Tires are probably one of the most important and expensive single parts on a bus that you're gonna have to replace on a regular basis. Um, tires for this bus right here, um, high-end, um, you know, Goodyear or Michelin tires, they're gonna run me about six to $700 per tire plus installation. So when you have six of them, well, you're looking at, you know, really easily three to $4,000 for all new good set of shoes for the old girl. You can get um, used tires and that's often not a bad way to go. And you can also get what are called recap tires. Recap tires are where they actually take the shell, the casing of the tire and fit new tread to it. Now, you can't install those on the front uh, for safety and a whole lot of other reasons, but you can put those on the back, and that's where, you know, four of your six tires are. So it's not a bad place to save money. Um, when I used to run a bus company, we would run, you know, recaps on the back because they're, you know, between two and three hundred dollars each as opposed to, you know, four or five or six hundred dollars. But the front, you always want the nicest tires you can mostly because a failure in the front is going to be catastrophic it's horrifying if, if you've never had it keep it that way but i've been driving a bus and had a front tire go out and it's very hard to maintain control especially at highway speeds fully loaded um, that's not something you want to experience so if you're out there looking at buses tire type and condition and age are super critical because it's something that's going to have a big impact on your wallet if you need to replace the tires as a general rule of thumb, you know, commercial vehicles, when they're in service, they can't run tires over seven years old. And that's a pretty good standard that I would suggest adopting for yourself, even though you're not in commercial service. Um, these tires are good for usually, you know, up to 100,000 miles. So they're much more likely to age out than they are to wear out. So that's why you'll have a set of tires like these that look really good, but they're actually getting old. So um, luckily, tires have a date code stamped in them and usually it's a four digit code it'll be a two digit week code and a two digit year code these tires should be good for another couple years but that's something i have to plan for in the future is that these are going to be swapped out and empty my bank account when you're out there tire or bus shopping you're tire shopping as much as you're bus shopping so keep an eye out these are um these have actually been pretty good tires for me so far, even though they're, they're kind of a cheaper brand of tire. So do some research, there's good deals to be had. And um, 
take care of the tires so they can take care of you. The, the last and most important thing I'm gonna talk about when you're looking at a bus is don't get a rusty bus. There's no such thing as a good deal on a rusty bus. I don't care what anyone has to say about that. I'm gonna die on that hill. And that's because once a bus starts to rust, you can't stop it. There's no going back. And the time and materials and skill it takes to do good bus rust repair is very high. And honestly, it's not how you wanna start your project. So I'm gonna show you uh, probably my second favorite thing about this bus, which is how clean it is. And that's because it's from Northern New Mexico, very dry climate, and they don't use salt on the roads. So I'm gonna slide under this bus here and I got my flashlight and I'll show you what I'm talking about when I say this bus is rust free. Now, it is a little filthy because I haven't washed it and uh, it's been driven on some dirt roads, but uh, I can assure you there's no rust on this bad boy. Here we are, and as you can see, there is just no rust anywhere, clean as can be. There's a lot of mud, which I'm actually gonna take some time and clean that all off because what that's gonna do, if you can see that mud up there, that's gonna trap water against the metal and that will start to create rust. But this was a rural school district bus, so I'll take mud and dirt over ice and salt any day. But there is just not a lick of rust on the whole thing, which is really cool. I do not wanna spend my time and energy fixing rust. I got a bus to convert and that is more than enough work <laughs> in itself. Well, thanks for watching this video. I hope, um, you know, it, it definitely explains why I bought this bus, but uh, hopefully some of the reasons that, you know, led me to this beautiful thing here um, will be helpful in you as you make your decision if uh, you want to buy a bus, which one you're going to end up with. Um, you know, as we all know, the prices are just going to keep going up and um, the good old ones are getting harder and harder to find. So, Best of luck on your journey and thanks for watching and see you in the next video.